Welcome to the CollectingCars.com podcast with Chris Harris and Edward Lovett. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collecting Cars podcast. Sorry we've been away for a couple of weeks, but um, we're all busy. I'm here with Edward Lovett, that's at Edward Lovett, and my old pal Richard Meaden, motoring journalist at Dickie Meaden. Um, he's always called Dickie. When I read his name as Richard Meaden, I always think um, that's not his name. But like any parent, <laughs> I only use his real name when he's in trouble. He knows. He always done, scold me. He knows when he's done something wrong. When Richard. I say Richard. <laughs> um, so it's great to have you here. Uh, he's oh, he's someone that I've knocked around with for a long time. So let's begin by, um, first of all, discussing the car you just turned up in. The unicorn. The unicorn. I, I only came to spoil any material you'd prepared already, <laughs> ripping it out of me for not using my 911. So that was my my motivation. What 911 is it? It's uh, it's a 964 RS. There we go, and that's the one that everyone wants. Yeah, I. Uh, it's a bit of a weird one because I've owned it a long time now. I bought it in 2006. And he bought it cheap, people. He bought it cheap. Be but, prepared. Be prepared. You can't see his smug face right now. <laughs> Is what? it because it's a bit hooky? <laughs> I don't think it's a moody one, is it? It's real. No, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a real one. Um, and I, yeah, I bought it cheap. It but it remains the most expensive car I've ever bought. So for me, for me at the time, I'd always wanted a nine eleven. I'd always wanted an RS nine eleven. I've been like you. I've been spoilt by having access to limitless access to all kinds of amazing cars. That access had shaped my taste and I so I, I love 911s it's clearly no secret and I really wanted an RS and that was the only RS I could afford 993s had already gone and clearly 2.7 RSs had already gone so it was the thinking back that was just the the thing that people bought and ragged around on track days wasn't it for years and yeah, years and years they were they were track that was you the go-to to, track if you, car. On, if you went on the Wheel Talk track events, the Nürburgring... They'd be bouncing to, off barriers. <laughs> yeah, they, were like, they were like disposable items, weren't they? If someone whacked one, they'd just go, well, that was a shame, go and buy another one for 30 grand, and away you went, because no one wanted them. For me, the amazing thing about the 94 RS, there is no vehicle that has a greater dichotomy between the way it was received when it was new and the way it's perceived now. Could go back and read the original reviews. Roger yeah. Bell's original review of that car in Car Magazine just goes, what are they thinking of? It's the most yeah. uncomfortable, pointless road car ever. But, but I think the way people's expectations and their and their use of cars, that it was right on the cusp, wasn't it? Because yeah. people didn't, a few people were doing track it wasn't days, a track day but not seriously. So it was a, a totally inappropriate car. But I think that's what, it, yeah, people's taste has come to that car now I yeah think I, I totally agree Por- Porsche created the genre of the road legal track day car with that didn't they before that there well, wasn't there wasn't a car you could just get in and go and pound out laps in the way you could in that would you see a 964 RS on a track day today you do occasionally but ve- but then but they're driven very softly or they're a you know there's something that was a track rat from the start and, th- and someone's not converted it into a road car or done something nice with it but even then, it's, I mean, even a bad one's going to be 150 grand, isn't it? I would have thought. Oh, at least. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm holding my mic while I avoid complaints. Yeah, we are that. aware Chris gets told off for <laughs> laughing into the uh, mic. I, th- I, I just, I think they're gorgeous. I had a, I briefly owned a 964 a couple of years ago um, through uh, Mr. Tuttle. Um, but it got written off, sadly, whilst being uh, PDI'd after its service. But that's another story. <laughs> was that uh, the green one? Yeah, the green one. Yeah, got written off. It's a it's a goner. It's an X. It was the it was formerly. And I, the, I, I vacillate awfully over time with which nine eleven shape I like the most. So when you bought your car, yeah. I had a nine nine three RS at yeah. that point. I had a few of those things back then because they weren't that much money. You no. s- I remember, you know, my kids used to go to school in a nine nine three RS because it was like a beta we had. Well, I mean, they were fifty grand. It was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of money, I know. Wait, but, 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 but for a long time. But you could have, my view was, you could, even though it looked ridiculous, that vehicle wasn't depreciating. So why wouldn't you? I'd rather have that than a sports car that's depreciating. And I remember thinking the 964 shape was a bit lumpy, a bit of a, it wasn't an old long bonnet car. It's the bumpers, isn't it? They, they sort of had a heaviness to but them now, the early But cars now, don't. I think they are the best looking 911s ever made. I don't. I, th- I look at 993s and think the front's a bit awkward with the sloping lights. There's something not very homogenous about the shape, which I used to think was amazing, and now I think the 964 is the yeah. best shape. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and it's just it's got the the profile 
it's just right. I think the stance of them, and I suspect the works of a Mr. R. Dickinson in California has probably helped people's appreciation of that car because actually it's the last of the true 911 profiles, isn't it? That yeah. that shape is is gone forever now. It's never. It's the, up, it's the more upright a headlight design. Upright headlight, upright screen, and when you're in them, the proximity to the header rail of the windscreen it's not quite as bad as an f40 or something but your the dash is tiny isn't yeah. it those door panels are tiny you're right near the edges of the car rather than modern stuff where you pushed relentlessly in towards the center yeah. of the thing it's it's all designed for that good front impact exactly <laughs> yeah and the way it's built i mean, just I, I always get in them and just you know i, I find a switch that is totally mismatched and designed completely differently from another switch. But you just know that you could sit there and flick it a million times. And and it'll yeah, work. The, yeah, the organ stop switches and... And the rubberized finish on the headlight. Nothing ever seems to wear in the way things... Things are either new or they're a bit worn through now, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. that thing. No, if you, take an, if you went into like a... 80,000 mile 996 Carrera. It just goes now. shiny, it, doesn't and it? It's, or, and it's or... falling, I mean, bits of trim yeah. are falling off, and uh, you know, 96, they were put together properly. Yeah, the, 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 I think the 964 is the one. So in the last week, I have bought an E34 Touring that's been converted in the UK by someone with a 3.6 litre M5 engine, which I'm loving. It's got a, It needs a little bit of snagging, but uh, this is my response to just slightly falling out of love with putting 20 grand down and being charged 500 pound a month for a car that you never feel like you own that does 190 miles an hour and consistently is a worry for your license uh and i've just slightly fallen out of love with with new fast cars in that respect this is my daily so i'm going to give this a go um and at the moment i'm loving it it's got no air con which was a bit of an oversight <laughs> yeah I'm so, part of that club. so like you you've just got out basically with a wet back so I just carry a spare Betty shirt. Betty yeah. um, And it's, um, but I'm loving it. I, 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 it gives me this a similar sense of satisfaction to your 911 because I'm now I now know that I have a a mild medical condition for German cars built between about 1983 and 1994. That's my yeah. That's my era. Those are the ones that I read about that I just was desperate to own. And when I Whenever I buy them, I never feel let down. If I buy stuff outside of that window, it tends to stay with me for a bit, then it goes. I, I, I think, again, it comes back to us being spoiled. I think the, the 964 was just just fractionally before I started on magazines. So I can remember the first magazine I worked on full-time was Car Week, and uh, John Simister and Brett Fraser were both senior members of staff there, and I was the scroty little road tester and i can remember brett i think the 964 rs possibly came through and then a speedster i think and i can remember brett i was sort of you know trying to put my hand up said oh well i'd, I'd quite like to do that and brett obviously took it and did it, <laughs> did it. and i hated him for it because it was just such a cool car so because i never spent any real time in those cars the next time i got to drive one was it was an evo magazine story i think built around 996 GT2, I think. And we we pulled together all the best 911 driver's cars we could, so 27 RS, 964 RS. I think we had a Club Sport 911 as well and really good selection of cars. But that was the first time I drove a 964 RS and that was immediate. And I only drove it for probably 20 minutes. And that was the point where I decided that's, that's the one I, that's that's the the one I want. And then it took another few years and then then I got one. And I think there's... There's a mystery about those cars that we, like you say, we read about, but we didn't drive. Yeah, absolutely. And since I... then, we know we just get in everything, drive it, next, you sort of move on. So it's very hard for a modern car to hold your attention, which these cars seem to have. You'll always, regardless of, of the access you have to cars, you'll always hanker over poster cars, unobtainium. Anything that, as you say, was outside of your window of experience or that you read about wistfully. So I want one of those. Sometimes stuff disappoints. Let's go. So let's go back here. So I first met. Uh, I started this in this world after Richard, um, and I, he was someone that I read as a as a student when he'd gone to performance car, and he was you know, and I, I have to blow smoke up his ass, and I, and I want to, and I, I don't do it um, because because uh, I'm trying to embarrass him because he, he is genuinely, if you don't know his work, and I'm sure you do, but he, you know he is 
the, you know, he's one of the very best driver writers that, the, that our country's ever produced or is, or is still working in motoring journalism. He's, he's a fantastic racing driver, great assessor of a car. Um, so I was reading him as a student and then I finally got to meet him when I was a sort of chief ashtray at Autocar Magazine doing what he was just described that he did at Car Week. Because um, that, that, that was the career progression then, wasn't it? You started off on a weekly if you could because the turnover product was, was high. Yeah. And I eventually met him a couple of times on launches and stuff. In fact, we described on a podcast previously me crashing a Peugeot 206. Because <laughs> you, because that was the first time I actually hung out with you, really. Yeah. And I, and I, because you had an interesting experience on that event as well. Was this ninety eight or ninety nine around then? Uh, uh God, I could, well, we la- we launched Evo in ninety eight, so this would have 99. been ninety nine, two thousand, maybe. It, it was it was reasonably soon after we'd yeah. launched. But so we'll, we'll, I, we'll, we'll cover I, Evo in a minute, but just tell, tell me about... Well, I too crashed a 206. You did, didn't you? Because did. we sat down for dinner and I had to fess... I thought, I could, there's only one person I can fess up to here. It's Dickie, I said. And I didn't really know him well, but, I, you know, weirdly... I think it was the mud all over your trousers that possibly gave the fact but, away but that you, you know, crashed. You, you must have had this a few times. I didn't know you from Adam, but because I'd read you for so long... I thought I knew you. It's, I've had this so many times with people that yeah. come up to me. They come up and they start talking to you like they're your mate. And you go, I don't know you from a hole in the ground. But actually, you've been reading me for ages. So therefore, you do know quite a lot about yeah. me. And I felt that that way about you at that point. But I, yeah, that, that launch, I, I can still... I was with Gus Gregory, the photographer. And we had a, a reader, as readers often do with Evo. We sort of put it out there and say, we wanted, we're driving this new car. Can you bring x to compare it with and someone took a absolutely beautiful 205 gti 1.9 and this was in the jura wasn't it it was just between on the border between geneva and it and was France. yeah yeah sort of divon around there wasn't it so we we were hooning around the, the mountains and on the way back this it must have been either late in the year or early in the year but there was some snow that fell but we weren't on a mountain we weren't aware of the snow had fallen <laughs> until we crested the sort of summit and it was perfectly dry on one side, and then it was just snow everywhere, and a long, gradual downhill slope into a considerably steeper sort of ninety right. <laughs> and it was oh my! It was the longest, slowest motion accident. It got to a point where Gus, I swear, opened the door, and he and he was trying to dig his heels in the, in the road <laughs> to try and stop it. It must have taken twenty five seconds for us to actually nose into the barrier and it, it didn't do any damage really um but then, your, we, so but then we looked in the mirror increased. and then we saw the 205 no. gracefully sort of following our line and that plumped into the barrier next to it <laughs> so it was just a total total disaster really that that shoot and then like you we ran back to the hotel dumped the car and jumped on the plane so <laughs> yeah i remember having dinner with you sitting there and thinking what what i want now is just a hamburger and a box of Kleenex to cry into and they they delivered a the, slab a slab <laughs> foie gras. of foie gras do you remember that we, I remember you and your you, we're not Emma, doing much to wife. dispel the myth about motoring journalists <laughs> and their lives at each other <laughs> thinking oh my lord yeah. no, so um, Evo um, is still still going on going strong as a, a car magazine and Evo was it, it was the flag bearer for the sort of fast car community it it was it became a, an icon in itself, and I, and you were there at the start. You founded it with Harry yeah, with the and boys. the others. Yeah, with Harry and John Barker. Um, Damien Smith did the artwork, and uh, Wide Boy Alan Patterson did all the commercial work right, for Pato. us. Um, so, and and you know that 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 point in time was, I think the the longer the time goes since we launched it, the more I appreciate the just how everything was aligned, all the planets were aligned, and you, the fact that we were able to to go for it and throw ourselves into it is is all credit to, to Harry. He just uh, unflinchingly sort of backed us with what we wanted to do. He looked after all the grown-up stress, the financial stress of it, and, and allowed us to just focus on producing the magazine. I mean, it seems so simple now. Tw- 12 issues a year... And I can still remember the conversation at the bottom of the stairs in the office saying, oh, this, uh, this uh, internet thing, uh, should we, uh, do you think we should buy, uh, buy a website address or something? And we just had this bizarre conversation now. Uh, 
and in that time, the the world media world has changed so much, hasn't it? I, I think what we year were, was that? What it was ninety eight, nineteen ninety eight? So oh. in the in the spring of ninety eight, EMAP uh, announced that they were closing Performance Car and merging it with Car. Because Performance Car, let's just stop there for a second. Performance Car was iconic in itself. Because let's not forget that was you know that was the place where you and John Barker and other other really good writers. Oh, Jeremy Clarkson, he was and, there. And Clarkson, you know, Clarkson's time. back page column in the broad, in the large format performance car was the thing that launched him. I mean, you know, he, it was it was the most outspoken. It was called Motormouth, wasn't it? It was yeah. it was the most outspoken column. It, and it was some of them you go back and read them are absolutely brilliant. Um, so this 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 magazine that that people like me absolutely loved. It was an absolute destination for me. And then I pick up an issue with the front, I remember the front cover had a Z3, an MGF, and a, something else with him sort of jump drifting them. MX5. I know, I know exactly where, the, where that place <coughs> is in Wales. And it just, just. That was the last issue. A- anyone would think we'd, uh, we couldn't really give a. F- yeah, well, <laughs> it, did, it did have a D mob happy look to it, Richard, with the airborne sideways shot in his Z3. When it landed, you can't even see the rear wheel. It's up in the wheel arch somewhere. But, and it said last never issue. And of course, if you, I was just. I was a student. That's all I did was read car magazines. I was beside myself. And and I and I never stopped to think all of these people are going to go somewhere and do something. So what they did was they, you know, they they borrowed the archive of performance <laughs> car and yeah. Harry had Harry had been a reader who'd come along on jobs, hadn't well, he? Well, yeah, our, our relationship with Harry started a number of years before. Um in fact, he was like the unofficial press office for for Maserati for ages when when Maserati Ghibli, were, didn't he? yeah, when Maserati were, was it Meridian in New Forest yeah, or yeah. somewhere? They never had press cars, and Harry had a, a Ghibli, and he that was pre-Cup Ghibli at that point, and he sent us some photos, sent us a letter, said, "I've bought this car, I think it's really rather good. I'd like you to, you know, see what see what you think of it, kind of thing." So we we met him and and drove the car, and he was he was just Harry, really. The, Harry hasn't changed; he's always been very generous with with his cars and so being a being a farmer they've got two weeks of work at harvest time and then they're kind of scuffing around moaning about the weather and stuff i can't wait i want to see i want to see h's face now as he's listening to, as, you, as you deconstruct his work ethic um, but so harry was great because he had some spare time always his time was flexible he, he'd love cars has a great passion for cars so he he just sort of hung out with us really he was a bit of a surrogate member of the team would help out on group tests um he swapped his Ghibli for Ghibli Cup, which was a that is a it's a car, isn't that it? That is a really cool car. Actually, we can talk about those later. But so so yeah, we I suppose it was a bit of a courtship process, really, because I think we knew Performance Car was uh, was being sent in a direction by EMAP that didn't sit particularly comfortably with us and the readers. Um, so when they took that decision to to merge it and and close close Performance Car. I think we'd already had some had some thoughts about what we could do, so we could act very quickly. So it, it wasn't quite seamless, but it was six months before. The- I don't think it was even that. I think it might have been the June issue or something of Performance Car where it closed, and then it was October I issue of Evo. To, I think I'd when started, we launched. I'd started working at um, uh, Autocar, and I'm going to Silverstone to watch Steve Suckley for racing TVR Tuscans, and John Barker had a dummy. With the the dummy with the orange Elise, yeah, that's on right. It. And I remember seeing it and thinking, "Well, I've, I'm working at the wrong place. I've gone to the I've gone to the wrong place. This was made for me." I remember looking at it and thinking, "God, well, I'm that's all we want. That's all we wanted to do." It sounds really self indulgent and 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 arrogant, and it, it 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 really wasn't at the time. But we just wanted to make the magazine that we wanted to read, and that's that's all all we did really. I, th- I can remember at the time. Big publishing companies, particularly EMAP, they would like to have this every every magazine, whether it was an existing magazine or or a new title that they were developing behind the scenes. It had to have a sort of typical reader, and they gave that reader a name and where they lived and what they did and and all of that stuff. And it was a process, I suppose, to focus the the team on what the magazine is. But we never felt it was that one particular person. It was almost. Uh, the best analogy I could come up with was you're at a petrol station filling your car up in a, say in a 205 or something. This is the Russell. You, you've got to give this to Russell, haven't you? No, 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 no. This was, was this, was uh, this, this was, Russell came up with the Evo-ness Did he? phrase. 
but the the petrol station scenario. Is that you? Yeah. I've always attributed that to Belgium. Well, I'm really sorry, Dickie. Yeah, that's all right. Apology well, that's, there. Yeah, that's quite all right. If you can attribute it to anyone, I'm quite happy for you to attribute it to Russell. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So you're at a petrol station. You're filling your car up, and that could be a could be a guy in a GT3 911. It applies as as much today as as it did then. There's a fancy car on one side of the pump and someone pulls up on the a younger version of that person pulls up on the other side of the pump in a Clio 200 Renault Sport or something and the guy in the Porsche looks across and thinks oh I loved that when I owned one of those and the guy in the Clio looks across and thinks I'm going to have one of those one day so it's it's, That's, it's the reciprocal respect of people that have and have not but they but they they're bound together by this love for fast cars yeah and it's not an envy and it's not a, it's just an ethos I suppose you get you know we all we all get it. It's the same as, you know, so someone would look at your well, we M5 had it early, in inverted we? commas and think, well, what's that snotty Shit old? Boxes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but just from the wheels and the look, if, if you know, you know, don't you? And that, that's well, we had the, it earlier. You got out of your 964 RS, saw his G63 and went, God, they are cool, aren't they? Yeah. And that, that, I think that, that reciprocal respect is what binds this community together. Although I think it's changed a bit, but we can discuss that in a minute. <laughs> I was talking about the magazine thing. I love that. We used to have those scenario planning meetings at Haymarket when there were still people thinking about investing in creating new titles. And what were we thinking? I mean, the in- there was this lurking beast called the internet around the corner that was going to decimate everything. But we would sit down and we'd had this discussion. We'd been told, think of a magazine that you'd want to read. So we go into this room and um, I had an idea for a, for a, a, a rival for Evo. I just thought the Haymarket, there was enough space that Haymarket could have a go at that. Yeah, and you had the guys... And to we do had the it as well, didn't it. you? And then Goodwin, so Colin Goodwin, who will be a part of this podcast <laughs> at some point, sat down. His idea for his magazine was was called Practical Formula Five Thousand, <laughs> <laughs> and then it, and his his lead story was Living with the Surtees TS Nine. <laughs> 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 and he rec- I mean, the projected readership was in double figures. Yeah. <laughs> and then when, when they questioned him, he said, well, but that's the magazine I want to read. There's no arguing with that. Practical <laughs> Formula 5000. I, I was going to ask, could you, could you replicate that today? You know, the magazine you want to read, but, you know, Magneto has just launched recently, mm. Road Rat. You know, there, there's obviously a, a, th- a couple of people out there I th- I th- keeping yeah, I th- keeping I th- hope alive for, uh, uh, for I th- print. I think... I think print has always had a place. I think it had a, there was a sweet spot when we launched Evo for probably from 98 to mid noughties, probably where it was, the market was with us as well, because I keep going on about Evo, but it, it sort of captures a moment almost because when we launched the magazine, the the landscape of cars was so different. So we relied heavily on Mitsubishi Evos, STI and Pretzers, Sky import lines. style, you know, grey import stuff, which which we sort of forget that even happened now. Well, but I remember we used to be we used to be involved in battles to speak to the tuners that were bringing them in to try and get the one before Evo got it. So rare we, imports. He was all, always the man for. All, I mean, uh, uh, Wallander was it? Wallander or whatever it was called, and, yeah. and we and we would go and Warrender. Warrender him. up in Oot yeah, North. Warrender, that was it, and we'd come yeah. up with these guys. Um, and um, and Licho, obviously Licho the well legend was that well is involved, and you'd be you'd be you'd be literally bidding them to try and get the car as it came off the boat. Who could get it first? Well, who's first one of them? Was it Warren? Or one of them flew a car from Japan to be um, the first? Uh, that really nice guy who now owns Extreme UK, whose name escapes me. Uh, He's a lovely chap. I'll think of it in a minute. But uh, he, it got he, to that point. He didn't flew it, an R thirty four in to yeah. be first. Because he knew that if he had the story in his name first, with his number, with his telephone number on it, he'd get twenty phone calls. I, th- I think uh, I, I, John Kirkham. That's it. Lovely chap. John. I miss that because there was a a lack. It was a bit like the Wild West, where was, the the manufacturers didn't have such an iron no. grip on where their cars went and and what happened to them. And the GTR was a was very much a this still had this cult kind of mystery around it and a few would get out and you'd hear all these apocryphal tales about their their performance but you it wasn't like you could just phone or email the press office no, you and say to, can I'm, you send a gtr around and we were quite lucky because old school had more resources than than evo did but then just in terms of people so i would be posted on a phone and i would phone these people i'd phone every single tuner. yeah it was a race wasn't it yeah. it was a, 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 and i think uh we miss that because it's. Uh, 
there are no surprises or very very few surprises now and if you if you're at all active on social media it's just a bombardment isn't it as soon as an embargo lifts it's just everyone in the industry is writing about the same car in the same place probably using the same handout images and it's just gone from when i was growing up in the last quarter of the ninth <laughs> 20th century you waited for a month to get your fix for from car magazine or there was nothing really on the tv there was or you you bought a vhs video or something of 1988 British Touring Club No, well, a lot of this is down to what Chris was saying about falling out of love with the, you know owning the new cars because there's the the joy has been taken out of it a bit I because think it's, it's, just, it's all there in front of you on social media. It's there's too no accessible. Treat. I it think is. there's no yeah, there's no mystery. There's no romance. There's no effort required to you know I I'm not a real engineering car geek but i i've always 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 read car magazines because my dad still reads car magazines always had i can remember going through all the specs i love all the group test stuff and you compare the power and weight you'd remember the numbers wouldn't you i couldn't remember anything at school but i can remember not 60 times no but i i i'm almost at a point where i don't i should i sort of i mean conflicted within myself now because i feel it's my job i should I should know all that when actually I knew far more and retained far more where before I worked in the industry because I was really immersed in it because I had to be because there was no other way of finding out and I think we're all probably a bit a bit jaded and a bit fatigued by just the sheer quantity of stuff that's out car content that's out there there's not much nourishment there's a lot of it out there but it's like fast food isn't it it's yeah. just I don't know, you gorge on it and then you either feel hungry 10 minutes later or you just yeah. feel a bit sick. Well, the, the, when you're writing something today, Richard, how what goes through your mind to make sure that that you've got your stamp on it, that someone knows it's a piece of your work, that it's different to a, what a influencer is saying over there or, or, or what someone's posting uh, online? I, th- I think I, I'm lucky because of the point I'm at in my career, I get the opportunity to do certain things and I'm not, you know, I know what it's like to have to grind out group test after group test or first drive after first drive for a for a weekly. And that was when you only had the magazine, not when you've got this sort of voracious monster of a, of a website that just keeps taking content. So I, I, I like doing things that are hopefully going to be memorable even if people don't remember my words they'll remember that car in in that place and then i'll just try and paint a picture around it i suppose and make it a little bit more well, answer personal for him, he's been modest so because the one good thing about being a very skilled driver and a really 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 talented writer is he knows that he's going to have an opinion and a voice and a confidence so the the, the thing you find with a lot of modern media is that what's outputted is is a part justification for having been on the event in the first place or having access to the car and and there's a and half an eye looking forward to make sure that they get invited back on the next one i hate to say it myself and dickie are in the same position i don't i don't really give a monkeys if i write something about or say something about a car that the manufacturer doesn't like and they say they're not inviting me back i couldn't give a shit yeah. just fine that's then then we just went talk for a bit and I think if you enter into it like that, and also knowing that you have absolute confidence in your and what in the way you assess the car, that's that's another thing. I never had a, and I know he hasn't. I've never had a problem. I get in a car, I go down a road, and I don't mind telling a hundred thousand people what I think. I don't need to go and phone someone and say, "I thought this was a bit." What did you yeah, think? No, I, I think you I, know, don't you? Pretty pretty much. We don't all away. agree on everything, you know. We've <clears> we've we've disagreed on fucking many. Excuse my French, many cars, and. Um, and I think, and I'll always want to do that, but you've got to have conviction. I know that even if I disagree with something he's said, he's written it because he believes it. Yeah. And he, and he stands behind it. He's not written it to appease anyone. That's how he feels. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a very fair point. And the, the manufacturers have obviously gone through a, a period at the moment where they quite enjoy... Uh, Look, the, the, young, the, youngsters doing what they say, when they say it's no, it. It's no, one, it's no one's fault at, at all. And I think actually... <sighs> It's it's a hard it's a hard view to express almost, but I think the 
the industry like to feel they have some control over the media but they need to be careful what they wish for almost yeah. because you need you need a bit of friction and a, and a bit of uh honesty about cars and and how they're reviewed because you can you know as we all know there's no shortage of of outlets where you can just have relentlessly positive reviews yeah. i use that in, in inverted commas on on your on your product but it doesn't help the manufacturer if all they you know if they think everything they they make it's is, it's a short is term brilliant strategy. and and it, uh, the actually the people i i i think of the the reader i almost think of i don't know like my dad or or someone who needs some they need some advice and you have to think hand on heart yeah. this is the right you know th- this is the right car or it's a good car or it's a or it's a bad car and and i think the industry the media side of it is is letting people down because they're not bringing young writers on they're not equipping them with the with the tools they need or the confidence and the experience confidence and experience are two sides of the same coin aren't they you, mm. you, you can't be confident genuinely unless you have some experience, experience. Yeah. So, but but you can have you can build confidence by being properly mentored i mean both of us learned from really good people like you know i sat next to Sutcliffe for a few years and i learned an enormous amount you know and, and i think you did the same with the people that, that yeah you i mentioned with. them though with um brett fraser who was road test editor on car magazine john simister was road test editor on on what car two very very different publications and two very very different blokes but they they actually kind of bookended the things i respected and yeah. looked up to because they were brett, the ba- they were brett's with, weren't they? brilliant and and you know loves cars loves driving hugely enthusiastic and and he'll bring color and and personality into something simmy is is very knowledgeable, very analytical, encyclopedic in his knowledge of everything he's driven, everything he's tested, and he will be able to refer to that. And he he instilled some rigor and some discipline and and pride. He used to write, he used to write, he used to write emails or write letters to Autocar about our road tests. They were brilliant. I, I should have saved them. But Pete, the the yeah. world needs people like yeah, you Simmons, do. Other, otherwise, you, you, it, we, we're lacking the sinister factor these days. For me, the words advocacy when we come back to the brands. So the brands. If, if you offer a brand the chance to spend not very much money and have universally positive reviews or whatever you want to call them, they're not reviews really, they're just coverage, if you ask me, of a vehicle, then, or to spend more money and open themselves to criticism, it, it, you know, it would be a very brave marketing manager that would say, well, let's go the expensive option and, and expose ourselves to risk. But actually, that's the sensible way forward. And they are slowly learning it because we've, we've just gone through a five-year period where uh, they've worked out that you can invite, you know, a certain number of influencers on a on a launch, or or people that aren't going to scrutinise the product, they're going to turn up and literally treat it as a kind of you know as a sort of lifestyle jolly, and just say something nice and post some pictures. But without that advocacy, without an independent voice saying that your product is good, genuinely a believable voice, you are leading yourself down a dangerous path because there comes a point where you where people will want to scrutinise what you're producing. Look at the revolution we're about to go through electric cars. People are going to want to know what's a good electric car and what's not. If everyone just says they're all good. Yeah. Th- then people, you'll start to find independent people coming in that will scrutinise them. No, well, I guess with, well, with a lot of uh, influencers, and we keep using the word influencers, but they're, they're talking about cars that are kind of sold out. <coughs> you know, there's no skill to really selling those. You know, they're not talking because no one's no one's going to go and look on one of the influencers about the new well, is, 320 is the, petrol engine are they that because that's well, because just no, not no no one's interested well, they're, not, they're not they're not covering those vehicles because they're not they're not clickbait no, but those they? are the cars that need to sell but they are and i think the other the other aspect of this that that's very interesting it brings me back to tvr what what dickie was just talking about there the idea of writing for you know, in your mind you've got the consumer of the car the person is going to buy this car that was that was really important and for me when i started out tvr was the really difficult one because the TVR machine, even though it was shambolic and chaotic and wonderful, it was it was an it was an amazingly pressured situation when you were a young journalist. You'd get to meet Peter Wheeler, you'd get to meet Ben Samuelson, and they would and they were great people and they would persuade you that this thing was the greatest car ever. And it was. They were loud, fast, hugely exciting, but they were also profoundly unreliable and they were just a problem. 
and often not finished. So you're in a difficult place. You'd stare Peter Weeder in the face, and he and his eyes said, "You're going to write something bad about my car because if you do, next time I see you, it's not going to be an interesting." He, he, he was he was awesome. And, but just to finish, I'm at, for me the changing point was I was sitting in the office typing out a story about the six the the, the, the small six cylinder. It was called the Cerberus Speed Six. Remember that one? Yeah, the, the little, yeah. the, it was a nice car, and it hadn't, you know, it'd just been a bit of a nightmare for us on the test. And I thought, normally we cover this stuff up. We were, as a as a group of journalists, we were guilty of giving them an easy ride. We didn't, we didn't put all the warts and all in because we loved the company, we loved what they stood for. And I suddenly thought, if someone had bought this thing on my recommendation and phoned me up and said, I I spent forty five grand of my hard earned money, I saved up for two years and bought this thing. And it's failed to complete the first three journeys. I thought I wouldn't be able to stare them in the face. And I'd rather actually have the difficult conversation with Peter Wheeler mm. than I would the owner of the car that I'd recommend to buy. And that, that was a bit of a that was a massive point for me in my life. I thought I'd I would I would far rather face the MD, the CEO, the chairman of the car company than I would the poor sod that had bought the thing on my recommendation because I'd not told them that yeah. it didn't work properly. No, it, it, it's a it is it is a level of responsibility, isn't there? To be to be honest about a car, I, I think as a yeah as a group, and I, uh, the group is yourself, Sutcliffe, Jethro, you know, our, our kind of uh, our peers, I guess. But we all felt, you know, TVR was a company with its heart in the right place, wasn't it? And they were doing building flawed, but we great wanted cars. them to win. I I would I would love to be able to go out and test a new TVR now, a new Peter Wheeler TVR. I don't know whether the latest incarnation of TVR is ever going to appear. I, I, I hope it does in a way because it has every, um, you know, it, it, it promises much of the same, um, you know, triumph and, and <laughs> tragedy almost. But I think, the, again, the world does need that. There's no, there's no, um, no one's out there really taking a risk with stuff, and and. But I think they will. I think I think my view is that media is cyclical, like anything else. And you go through. We've just gone through a very lazy period where manufacturers, car manufacturers, have got lazy because there's easy exposure through people that don't really offer an opinion. They just promote. You know, if you're going to get a, some some young guy or girl can come along, give you a million views for not much money, and, they, and they're going to always say it's great. Why wouldn't you? God, if I was a car company, I'd do that. But the problem is that there are now more and more people doing that. So one of them, you watch, one of them or two of them will break free from it soon and suddenly become a massive thorn in the side of the car makers. They'll start to scrutinise. They'll, they'll, they'll work it out. They'll say, one of us, I need to be different to my peers. So I need to be aggressive. And you watch. I bet you in the next couple of years, there'll be... I mean, that Sal Mondrian guy is slightly doing it with McLaren, isn't he? I mean, he's yeah. he's gone from being buddy-buddy to, like, you know, his Senna burnt down. He's not very happy about it. And now he's on their back. Yeah. So he's gone from being comfy influencer to, you know, sort of angry scrutinizer, which I think is actually think is really positive. Yeah. So I think, we, I, think, I think we've gone through the nice period. I think it's going to change. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think. No, funny. There was uh, I, I noticed on Twitter this week someone was um, not particularly happy with the build quality of their Rolls Royce, and this is a person who's involved in their own car company. Yeah, and uh, it, it took him to take <laughs> Rolls Royce on via social media to get um, something replaced in his car. Yeah, yeah. So I, th I think these, ki I think the the kind voices might become a bit angrier. And as you know, I quite like a bit of anger. So, so <laughs> it's I, not I, like you at all. Um, so, so um, Evo was was going along well, but like anything, you need another challenge. And uh, in about end of two thousand and seven, um, or yeah, some, yeah, yeah, end of two thousand seven, Richard Foamy said, um, "How are you getting on with uh, Oscar?" And I, I'd been a freelancer there for a long time. I had other clients as well, and I was a bit frustrated. I wanted to make the next step. I don't know what that was. The internet was just happening, but no one could work out how to monetize it. No one knew what to do with it. It's strange, we're still in the same place. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, but um, uh, he said, should we try and do something? And I went, yeah, okay. And um, and literally over a cup of tea, we decided we would both leave our positions, which looking back now was quite brave because I think we both had the best jobs in motoring journalism at that point. Yeah, I think was. we were caught in very comfortable ruts, weren't we? Yeah, I think. we were well-remunerated people working with for two titles that didn't really we could do what we wanted to do 
and I think we were outputting good quality work. We must but have been insane. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were. So we decided to start um, uh, a website, web community with some other people, which we're, we're going we're gonna to do a Drivers Republic um, podcast. So we're not going to spend too much time on this now. Cause we'll, get the, we'll get the full team in one day and do Drivers Republic. Because most people listening to this won't even remember Drivers Republic. But it was the thing that nearly broke me. Um, <laughs> Financially or oh, mentally, <laughs> physically. physically. <laughs> Everywhere. I mean, I, I now, you have to go through the process of starting a business. To, to fully respect people that do. So you were I, before your time, Chris. Yeah, well, I, and uh, he mentioned it recently in a in a, in a in a it was either a tweet or some message. Yeah, it was a tweet. That, that we went, we had to go around and pre-sell this thing. So Drivers Republic was formed um, with myself, Dickie, Jethro, n- the brilliant Neil Carey, Alan Patterson, and a guy called Steve Davies as well. And we we basically had to go and go around all the car manufacturers to get their support. We were known entities, so that was fine. We had to go in there and say. This is what we're doing. And that was a road show that lasted a month, going to every car maker, trying to pre-sell it. And we sat down with a guy called John Zamet at Audi, who's now retired. Um, and we told him what we wanted to do. And he, looking back with remarkable prescience, said, yeah. he said, it looks like a really good idea, but are you sure it's not an Audi A2? And we went, what do you mean? He said, a really great product was just ahead of its time. And he nailed it. Because the Audi A2 was this all aluminium small car that people now fight over trying to buy one because they're so efficient and light that if you put the windscreen wipers on, it shakes the body. I mean, they're amazing vehicles. Yeah, they're very cool. But no one back then wanted it because it was a bit too expensive, a bit too forward looking. So you'd just go the safe option and buy a Fiesta because really it was a it was an Audi badge Fiesta sized car that was double the money to give you 60 mpg. And he was right. It was. Drivers Republic was ahead of its time. It was a, it was basically a Facebook style community with rev- with a review area that was that we wanted to grow out into a full style community. But it was when you th- it was pretty. It was the p- domain name there. It- oh, <laughs> well, there, there's a, there's a <laughs> story. <laughs> there's a story in that one. That's for the other podcast. Uh, but it was it was pre iPad, wasn't it? That's yeah. the crazy thing. We we sort of we bought the first iPad as the business folded. <laughs> <laughs> And I can remember the bloke coming in to show us to demonstrate our page turning technology because it was all you know, fl- you know, flippy flippy. You remember that? Bloke? Yeah, it was like a magazine. It, it had yeah. to mimic a magazine, didn't it? And, it was and just... looking back, I'm really glad we had a go. I have, but I have so much respect for people that have made a business succeed from the start. I have so much sympathy for the pain they go through. You don't know what it's like until you're, you know, looking at the ceiling every night at four in the morning, thinking, how on earth am I going to pay the mortgage? And what am I doing? And the double whammy, of course, is not only are you, not only are you throwing money at it you're not earning money no. at the time we weren't so um it was so, so so that happened at the end of 2007 so in 2008 we embarked on this grand journey and we were all looking at night frank websites for the massive houses we were going to buy <laughs> when we when we sold the business to bill gates for a billion and it was looking back it you know it was part it was part fascinating part delusional but it but it was what it did do is it made me and I think all of us slightly fearless about change. You know, you just look around you and you know the world's going to change. You have to embrace that change and be a part of it. Otherwise, you will get left behind. And and I think even though, it, you know, we launched it at, at the end of 2008 and our first commercial deals came in the Monday that layman's went under i mean the timing of it couldn't have been better so that basically everyone just went right we're going to just shut the coffers we're done we're not spending a penny and we're yeah those start. those that did understand it within the industry so marketing people or or pr people those who did didn't have the money to spend um because they were they were sort of getting locked down and those who didn't get it probably had some money to spend but it it, it was it was a colossal thing to try and do, wasn't it, actually? But I think it's only... Uh, I think I, I f- where in my own mind with, with Evo, Evo was like, how long can you hold your breath almost? And it was like, work harder, work harder, work harder, work harder. And, and you could work through it and, and come out the other side. And then when you did, it started to improve. But the, I think what everyone's finding with any any kind of web content, venture is it's as soon as you launch you've you've lit a fire haven't you and then you just have to keep throwing throwing more and more stuff at it to keep it burning and it's if you you're terrified if you back off it's going to go out and you'll never be able to get the thing lit again i think a bit i'll bring it back to my geography um 
geography A level. In in terms of vegetation, there's a thing called sears, aren't they, which stages of development. And in the in the UK, if you leave a patch of land, just barren, um, if you leave it for a thousand years, you'll end up with either oak or ash on it. That's what happens. So that's the climatic climax vegetation of the UK. Is if you leave a patch of land with the right that's fertile, you'll end up with either an oak tree or an ash tree. That's what ends up with a web venture. You end up shit or bust. <laughs> well, well, it's even more. It's even more sinister. And we'd we'd reached a stage in media where there was a final stage, which was called a magazine. It was an established brand, and you knew what you did. You had a distribution network. You made the magazine, and you knew that your the only thing that could compete with you was another magazine coming in and taking and being better than you. But it would you knew what what that would take, so you had no worry about it. The problem with the with the with the web is that you could you know you could create a great platform. Look at Piston Heads. You know Piston Heads emerged, took all of the con- sort of enthusiast car magazines away at the shins commercially because it had the classifiers and everything else. But Piston Heads is now you know I, I, I respect the guys that work on it, but Piston Heads is no longer the zeitgeist. Let's use that word. I know it's a bit cringy. It's no, a bit Chris Bangle. But, so, but social media changed that, didn't it? Because prior to Twitter and everything else, you would make a conscious effort to every morning you would go to the home page of a website, see what's on it, have a browse around, yeah. sling your hook again. Now yeah. you just follow links that are on your own you've feed. Got an, you've got so you app. never stray from, yeah. from the path you've laid out for yourself. So Quite if right. something right. out there you're not aware of, like I, I don't do Facebook, but it's the it's like air, isn't it? It's the it's all around you. It's the biggest thing ever. But I'm blissfully unaware of it because I don't engage with it on on any level. Well, so nor do I actually, because and I, largely because someone set up someone set up a fake account in my name and was communicating with and had made friends with my friends and communicating <laughs> with them. To they the thought point, they, Chris is very friendly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, much more friendly than he normally. Well, no, is. What's this picture like, he's just sent me? <laughs> so I got a mess. I got a message about a year ago saying I didn't realise you were going to the theatre in Stratford, and I went, <laughs> what? And uh, and I said that's not me. And he went, well, it's on your Facebook. I went, can you forward me the link? And there was this bloke, a bloke. I, don't, I presume it was a man, had just created a life of me. <laughs> Luckily, I mean, he could have been quite sinister. He wasn't out sort of you know fucking pigs or anything. But it, but, but but it was but it was uh, it was pretty full on. So no, I I think so. If you're friends with uh, Chris Harris on Facebook, just, <laughs> yeah. uh, just, be, just if beware. Me, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you're not friends with me. <laughs> but the but this this idea that there was a that there was a, a stability to the world. You know, you woke up and you knew that Steve Croppy was going to write a column every week in Autocar, and that and that you know, Car Magazine was going to create a be- another beautiful feature, and that Evo was going to show you another amazing cornering shot of Dickie slightly sideways, and with with Gus Gregory photos that showed the tread block of a nine eleven just pouring at the time. For me, I knew the way the world worked. I, wo- I woke up, there were no surprises, and I looked back. And I miss that world. I love the excitement of the world I currently work in, but I miss the stability of that. You knew where you were. Now, you know, you could set up, you know, Piston Heads is no longer the Zeitgeist. It's a great product. Don't get me wrong. It's a great product with some great writers, but it isn't the Zeitgeist. What is the Zeitgeist at the moment? You could argue it's a Schmi or it's a supercar blondie mixed in with a bit of Top Gear, mixed in with a bit of Car Wow, mixed in with a bit of, you know, I don't know what it is, but it, but it, it but what you can be sure is, it won't stay like that for long. It'll stay like that for 18 months and then something else will come along. Yeah. I, I, I kind of find, that, yeah, that, that's all swirling around. But actually, if you step off that merry-go-round, you'll find some of those magazines are still there and they are still doing good yeah. good work. So Autocar's still there and they, they, they big push for online content, but the mag's still out. Evo is actually enjoying something of a resurgence i think the last year or so with it, Stu it, gallagher in, at the in, helm in readership yeah, or, yeah. Cir- circulation is is improving and uh, in terms of quality when did you start writing for evo again dicky uh well I, I i kind of had that sabbatical 2008 2009 that was a plug then and uh well, it just seems it just seems to be a coincidence here, <laughs> well no I, w- I wouldn't say that at all but you and you and jethro are back, back writing for yeah, it aren't and you? john barker's back doing stuff yeah. so we sort of got the Got the band back together, really. They got rid of. The, they got rid of the. There's a few interlopers in the sort of yeah, nine, ten, eleven period. Yeah, these transients. One was called uh, Chris Harris. <laughs> <laughs> Co- coincided with a dramatic. He shamelessly collapse. used Evo for his own uh, his own promotional 
purposes. Well, do you remember? When, so when we so we will do a separate Drivers Republic podcast because it will be very funny and it will be fueled by it'll be it'll be sponsored by Lager. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, we'll, and some of the stories that will come out will be fantastic. Um, but uh, so post so Drivers Republic fails in the middle of two thousand and nine. We're out of money. We're out of ideas. We're done. And the world looks pretty bleak because we've gone. So you've given up your easy life at Autocar and Evo, and suddenly you're thinking, what do we do? And Harry, bless him, um, finds up myself and Dickie and goes, well, we might be, a, you know, do a spot with you here with this internet thing, a few videos for you, and Dickie do some writing. And um, typically, Harry, with his eye on the commercials, invited Christopher to join before myself. Chris was all over the videos. So we got the videos going and um, we went back to, we went back and did a stint at Evo, which actually seemed a long time ago. But I, I, I found some of the old columns, quite, some of them aren't bad actually. Um, and it was a, it was a, do you know what? It was nice. It was like, it was like having sort of just had a, a year eating really spiky chilies and then someone saying, have a glass of milk and a, bit of bread mm. and just settle for a bit let's just go back to the way life was it was obvious to me that it wasn't going to last for a long time but it was uh i you know i'll, I'll say thank you to harry here now because it was uh, you know we were in we were struggling and uh, he gave us a, a home to go to for a bit and i think the mag was was quite good at that point as well we had, we had some fun yeah it's had it's, it's it's like most mags it has its ups and downs and um you know pe- people i think it's a bit cyclical and i, I think actually the all the magazines I've worked on, the team have known when it's not right, probably bef- a bit before the readership does. There's always a bit of a lag. So then you start to improve it and then you get seemingly get more people moaning about it, but they moan about stuff that happened a while ago. And yeah. then eventually it all gets back in sync. And then I think certainly with another blatant blag for, for Evo, but I think since Stu Gallagher, who was another original team member at Evo so he's known it throughout its life he's gone back to first principles almost and trying to let features breathe and and declutter the cover and because you I'm sure loads of people that are listening read car magazines but and, and all sorts of magazines but they probably don't understand the the process that you're forced to go through every single month or every single issue by um, or the exterior influences that you have to appease that make no sense. That's the, the other thing, isn't it? You know, you've got, you've got everyone thinks well, it's easy to do a cover, but it covers by bloody committee. You've got three or four it's, people it, come it, in and tell it, you what it, to there, do. There's nothing worse, and there's there's sort of hot spots in certain bits of the cover, and you need to mention this and that. And before you know it, it's just like someone's fired a blunderbuss full of shit at the cover, yeah. and you can't actually make out anything. Whereas. What what we always wanted to do with Evo, and then what's what's happening now? I think is the covers are becoming cleaner, the cover stories are better resolved, and they're not following the diary. Because what is the point in following the diary with something that's, you know, you can be on deadline and think we've just got we've just got this last. Well, that must last be a great release, must not it, for to edit it's a magazine yeah. now? Because because the diary no longer matters to you. No, it's what it's the cars that you know. It's the cars that matter. It's people. It's roads. It's it's experiences. It, it's it's all the things that generally Twitter or Instagram or they don't they can't give do it because they're here and gone and they're very much in the present in the here and now. The, a magazine gives you gives you freedom, and I'm I'm really you know pleased to see things like Triple Zero. If you're a Porsche geek, you probably already read Triple Zero, which is an amazing product. Road Rat is a beautiful beautiful. You know, it's it's what print. Should, I've only just seen always... the first copy of that. That is lovely. So yeah, so Michael it's Harvey and the others. It's just a tactile, beautiful yeah, object. Yeah. But you know, the, and it's it's a it's a crafted product, and that's but, well, what you know. You go on there, and be. you've got Nick Trot writing twenty pages on the nine seventeen. If, to come to come back to your original hypothesis, which was you know, make the car magazine that you want to read. Yeah, that's I'd love to write a twenty page article about nine seventeen. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think it's it indulges in a way that that online media can do in a way but it's it's very different i think what i'm still what i miss you know i love i love these sort of more boutique kind of quarterlies or periodical magazines but the the big beasts so car magazine evo autocar they have a an ability to to create 
tests or stories on on a scale that you would never really attempt to do yeah. with a website and and which wouldn't perhaps be appropriate for a road rat or but, magneto type thing and also they don't work they, you can't video them i mean at the outset when we were doing videos for evo and and before that for autocar because i did those for a while before we did drivers republic the idea of course the, it, on a piece of paper you'd say well we're going we're taking all these vehicles to wherever to do this test so we'll just hire a video bloke and he can just video what goes on we'll make a film and of course you come back and you had no film because what what you need to create a still shoot is entirely different to what you yeah. need to create a video shoot and you can't you cannot recreate the you know the process or the gravity of the words or anything and it just looks like a really shit fly on the wall mockumentary of a of a load of people me- doing a film shoot it's what standing it's what it in lay-bys like. throwing rocks at yeah, signposts and, that, and, and that's and it, it, i remember thinking god this is a bit tricky and 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 that's where for me magazine you know i think if you start out in magazines you always love magazines i love what i do i love making films but ultimately my heart will always be in a magazine and the fact that i write top gear as well is going through a bit of a resurgence and the latest issues of top gear magazine I, am i allowed to plug that i think it's a great looking thing you are and, and for me magazines will always satisfy me on a level that no television program or internet film ever will and 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 if when i when i finally leave this place and shuffle off the mortal coil and you bury me with one piece of car media it will be it won't be a film i did it'll be a cornering shot. it'll be a still image of one of the cars that i drove shot a certain way probably with a bit of angle on it because that's I still think I It'll still be that get cornering more. shot of the nine nine three GT two you sold, Chris, that you always love to be remembered about. Oh, you're such Remind. a kid. <laughs> Better to have loved and lost, Richard. <laughs> well, why? Says, uh, why is Top Gear having a magazine having a resurgence? Because I think people. I think. I think the market. I think the marketplace got a bit cluttered, so there's been a bit of a clean out on the general front. Weirdly, the specialist magazines have exploded. So there's now, whereas there used to be one Mercedes Benz magazine and one Porsche magazine, one BMW magazine, there's about ten. Well, of there's each. so many, yeah. But but uh, but they sustain themselves, and um, and I think the specialist, sort of the non-specialist car magazine area, is a little less cluttered, and is a bit better defined. And I also think people have gone through a period of saying, I don't want to buy a car magazine anymore. I can get it all on the internet for free. And that and the those outlets have reduced what they're putting up online. They're not being as generous with their offerings online. And people are saying, I still want that experience. I still want those opinions. I still want to be in, entertained that way. I better go and buy the magazine again. Yeah, is that a fair summary? I think so. And you don't you don't know what's coming with a magazine. You know, yeah. there, there is an element of surprise in the in the content, whereas I just get sick to death. Of... Oh, I thought you meant about when your copy was going to arrive. Well, that's always a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> That is always a surprise, but I, I, I think I, I just sound like such an old codger. But modern life, you you order a bloody I totally agree. Order a lampshade online, and then for the next month, you're bombarded by Google with, "You bought a lampshade. You must want a light bulb, <laughs> a plug, another lampshade." No, I don't actually. So it's kind of, and and that's oh, I get what, off, I get off other other things. Well, yeah, I'm sure <laughs> you. <yeah. laughs> I, I don't know. I, I just I, I just like I, I like the idea of um, I, 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 I enjoy watching some car content online. Don't get me wrong. I'll sit there and, and particularly when I'm on deadline, I, I find a huge appetite for, for watching YouTube videos of old rally cars and things. But I, I don't know. But there's a sense of, of thought and and curation with a magazine and and you can go off at tangents that don't rely on search or or it's just you've obviously got to go into a shop and buy the magazine you don't well, you want if you, sub- you don't you want to order the magazine you know, online you, you or can, you'll you be getting su- hassled you, you can you can subscribe and i don't know there's another magazine i'll give another are they, plug. Are they all are they, uh, evo you can download a digital magazine yeah but i th- they, they've sort of gone in we used there's, to do an interactive one. Yeah, didn't there's we? different versions of With those, and they s- pages. Yeah, they kind of ebb and flow, and then they're redesigned and read another platform. And can't uh, bother with it. You sit, you sit with it for some reason. And I've got the new big iPad, whatever thing. Pro. And um, well, I didn't. Know, someone you gave legend. it to me. Yes, a friend <laughs> gave it to me as a present. A very generous friend. And uh, amazing firewires of seeing the vehicles. Um, <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, he did. Mas just gave it to me. It's like what? That's very generous, Mas. And. Um, and I was, you know, I was flicking through a magazine. It just, for some reason, doesn't work for no, me. Well, it don't, just you doesn't. Don't you like the noise? I just, I, I'm you spend much... your whole life looking at a, looking at a 
you know, retina display think, Apple yeah, yeah. screen. I, think, I, think yeah. I the, kind of want a grainy printed yeah. page. With I think one on of it. the one of the there were many ironic moments in Drivers Republic. Ironic, maybe the wrong word. Soul shattering might be the other way of describing it. When we were sitting down trying to define how you'd make this work, how do you monetize this thing we're doing? What 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 platform do we need to make money from car media? And what we wanted was something that was portable, um, updatable, um, that, can t- that was a, a, a means of us transmitting our emotions for the cars we were writing about, and that you could sell against. That was the most important thing. Could you sell against it? You know, could you sell the inventory that you that wasn't editorial pages? Could you sell it? And of course, when you scrutinise that and you're sitting there trying to build a web empire, the obvious answer is a magazine. <laughs> <laughs> is a better thing for doing that. And I, I always come, I remember sitting in the room with, with him and Jethro and the others, think, and it, it, it hit me, I thought, oh my God, we might need to do a magazine here. And we were going to do one, weren't we? We were going to do this print product on the back yeah. of it, which I think would have been the right thing to do. Yeah. Because cause you, you were trying to sell this this sort of, this space, but it was it was ether, as, as Dickie described Facebook, you're trying to sell this air to people for, you know, 20 grand or what have you. You didn't quite know what you were delivering. The metrics were all being made up by these agencies. And then you suddenly think, well, actually, if you can, actually, if you can say we're going to print 80,000 of them and you can have the back cover and we can tell you that these people re- are reached, it's tangible. Yeah. I think people like to possess things as well now, don't they? Or you've gone through a phase where you don't own anything. Your music comes through... Spotify, yeah. your uh, now you want to be on vinyl, you know, and 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 if all that, if your account closes or you 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 don't have access to that, whereas you used to wait for an album to be released, go and buy the CD or whatever it was, and you'd have a body of work that you would listen to, enjoy, understand as that body of work. Whereas now everything's a playlist, isn't it? You never hear anything in its entirety. You never, I I don't know. I I, I think. There, there is a, a definite shift towards um, more, the zeitgeist more. is changing. So on that note, um, we're going to take a little break, and, and when we come back, the the curmudgeonly old men that have been talking about why magazines used to be great, uh, we'll we'll come back and we'll talk about some racing cars that we've driven, and also some other um, anecdotes um, that probably will make people giggle. So um, I, I have a gift for you as well for the second. Part, Chris, oh. but I won't spoil the I surprise. What, I don't know what that is. So um, that was the first part of the a collecting lampshade. cars. Uh, a lampshade. <laughs> that was the first part of the collecting cars podcast. Please go and have a cup of tea, uh, maybe a comfort break, uh, maybe even a cake, because um, all three of us look like we've had a few of those. Uh, and we'll see you back for the second part in a minute. Collecting cars: the safe, smart, and simple way to buy and sell collectible cars an online auction platform for the UK and Europe. Follow us on Instagram at Collecting Cars and also CollectingCars.com. The CollectingCars.com podcast with Chris Harris and Edward Lovett. Well, I hope you're uh, relieved. Welcome back to the second part of this Collecting Cars podcast. That's at Collecting Cars with Dickie Meaden at Dickie Meaden and Edward Lovett at Edward Lovett. So we've we've basically opined on magazines and the media and come across as right old <laughs> bastards that are bitter about life. Let's move on to some of the cars we've driven. Because the one thing that we can say over and above some of the, the, the new world that vexes us is that we've we've driven some stuff over the years, haven't we? Would you have believed, would the 17-year-old Richard Meaden have believed he'd driven the stuff he'd driven now? Oh, God, no. No, 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 no. I, I, I think I... It's what I hoped because obviously you read magazines so you you see it and anyone that grew up reading car magazine was weaned on supercar drive stories and things so yeah that's the only reason I wanted to be a journalist I didn't want well a motoring journalist I didn't want to be a journalist it had to be about cars and some people might know this probably not many but I it's a weird industry to get into isn't it you speak to 10 different motoring journalists and you get 10 different routes there's no conventional way into it there so isn't I, a career path I I got into it through the William Lyons Sir William Lyons award which is run by the Guild of Motoring Writers and Are you still a member of the guild I've I've never been a member of the guild on Well you won the William Lyons No well I, I I didn't I didn't win I was uh I, I think I probably 
kind of engineered it that they created a runners-up position. So for those position. listeners that don't know what we're talking about here, just to clarify, the Guild of Motion Writers is an organisation, a body designed to protect the interests of motion writers in the UK. It's viewed as being a little bit antiquated, but I think it still has a place, and I gather it's still it's still going strong. Um, I've never been a member myself. Uh, it was it was at some point considered the thing that you had to be. You weren't a proper motoring writer unless you were a member. I've always been a bit renegade and, and wasn't. And Richard's now explaining the fact that <laughs> they had a prize. There was a prize that would support a young motoring writer, and um, and they'd get a bit of a bit of money from it. It was called the Sir William Lyons Motoring Writing Award, and it yeah, sounds it's been like a, it's it's. It's a bit of an institution, yeah. actually. I think David Vivian did he? Oh, do some it? of the best and writers have won it. Quite a lot of people yeah. have come through that. Not including that, me. That system. <laughs> so it's uh, that. That's how I kind of toe in the water, I suppose. But at that point, if you can imagine, you you get through to the the final five people, and it's it's specifically for for younger people, so seventeen to twenty one or twenty three, I think, when I did it so you've got five people there for a panel interview in um in a hotel suite in london somewhere and you're just called randomly to go and sit in front of um a couple of motoring journalists a couple of people from jaguar and someone from the from the guild and they just grill you i suppose on your your intentions and why you want to be a motoring journalist and stuff and when was this 1840 yeah this was uh a bit different when, now. when it would be oh my god 1990 be 30 30 or 31 years ago i think so 89 88 89 i did it a couple of couple of years um so yeah we're all, all the 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 sort of hopefuls are in the room and then one of you gets called through and and the others are sort of saying well what are you going to say what are you going to say and that everyone was being horrendously worthy and that they you know they were interested in the industry side and they wanted to be a news reporter and stuff and I said well no fuck that I want to I want to drive the cars I want to be a road tester and oh, oh, no, don't say that don't say that so I I just kind of went in there and said I'm sure this is probably the death of my hopes to win the award but i want to be a journalist because i want to write about driving cars because i did and at that point what was your experience of driving cars minis uh, my f- yeah um <laughs> um uh, austin metro van was my very first car which is a bit embarrassing then i had a mini uh, but i was working in a sand and gravel quarry when i left i was appalling at school scraped through college wasn't going to get to uni parents sort of had a disaster on their hands so they made me get a job i found a job in a quarry company and i got a pickup truck and i got to hoon around so that's how you learn that's how you learn oversteer basically yeah i got bollocks every day by every single quarry manager and (laughs) there you go i didn't know that that's great (laughs) yeah so i know i I used to tear tear around quarries in an irresponsible manner often try and take the pickup truck home and practice on the way home. I had my first spin on the road in a Bedford Brava <laughs> truck. <laughs> Complete 180 in that. So, so let's fast forward. What was the what was the first time, I know when it was for me, what was the first time when you were sitting in a car and you thought, wow, I've I've slightly got to the point I wanted to get to. I've not made anything here. I've made it. No, no, there's no moment when you've, I've, none of us have done that yet. <laughs> but but there's a moment when you're, I'm sure there's a moment when you're testing a car professionally You've been loaned that car because you're known to be all right at what you do, and you sit back and think, oh, "Wow, what was that car, do you reckon? Uh I think it, it was certainly early early days at Car Week. I can rem- the the thing I remember most vividly about Car Week was the Caterham Caterham Seven, um, and I think it was the K Series K Series Super Sport or something. I think, yeah, yeah. but before the six speed box, so yeah. it had this five speed box with yawning ratios, so it kind of ran out of puff after third gear probably but i absolutely loved it drove it the whole week did about 1500 miles in it drove it into central london and back every day went out on the photo shoot and that i'd always i think again from reading magazines being a kid i think it was the inside front cover advert of motorsport there was always a black and white catering cars yeah. advert and i i was fascinated by that car then so to to drive i went to dartford Picked the car from Jez Coates, had the um, lesson on how to slip the roof off with the analogy to a young lady's bra straps, <laughs> <laughs> which being car geeks, neither of us would have understood <laughs> at all. <laughs> but I nodded sagely at that point. Um, 
So yeah, so, about... so your your mum's bro. <laughs> <laughs> so that yeah, that that for me, I think was I just. I loved that week because it was just really. I, I loved every mile of every journey of every day. I had that. Did car. you find, as I found, because I had a similar experience when I started out, that I that I had this awful sense of foreboding that it that that might be it. That I that what was the next thing? Because I just thought, I, and this is where I want to be now. I want to be at the coalface in the fast cars doing this. And if they plump me back on the news desk for three weeks, I'm not sure I can do that. Well, I think I I was always very lucky because again i keep mentioning um brett fraser and john simister but they really took me under their wing so i'd done i'd managed to get a couple of weeks work experience at what car when simmy was there this is well before i got a full-time job so after the william lyons award um thing Debacle. so i plugged away for years and years and years to, until there was an opening for, for a full-time so job. were you still in the quarry at this point yeah yeah yeah, taking increasing long... amounts of holiday and sick. <laughs> how, how long? So from from the from the moment you first had contact with the industry, i.e., as work experience or William Lyons, to the point you got your first salary job, how long did that take? Uh, I think I did William Lyons in eighty eight or eighty nine, and then it would have been ninety. When did Car Week launch? Ninety two or ninety three? So it's four. Ninety two, three, good, four years. A good four years. And I, I started. It's a long to time, do... isn't it? Cause it, cause it, it is. Because you, because you, I remember it took me two and a half probably. And I, and from the moment I first had contact with industry and work experience, I knew that was what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted nothing. I else. loved it. I loved the informality of it and the slight madness of it. And, and but the... I couldn't. But to not be able to get into it was earth shattering for me. You know, and I knew that I could only get a couple of weeks work experience in the summer, maybe one in the winter. That's all they would offer because they had to rotate other people. And I had this. I had. I just knew. I knew that's what I wanted to be. Those are the people I wanted to be with. That's what I wanted to do. And I didn't. I couldn't get a job. And I. And it was a really low point in my life. Weirdly, I just. I. I struggled with it. And yeah. what was the first car? For, for me, uh, it was probably a five fifty Maranello. Actually, quite you know reasonably early on, I remember being given a five fifty to go home for the weekend because I had to go somewhere really early Monday morning, and I just drove this thing and I thought, I'll never be able to afford one of these. I'm, you know, I'm, it's an utter privilege to drive it, and I just loved it. I just remember thinking, this is what it's all about. I just, I, I loved the process of trying to understand the car. I, yeah. I loved the idea of then sitting down and gathering my thoughts about it, stamping my opinion on the vehicle, all of that stuff I loved. But it, and I, and it could have, it wasn't the fact that it was a Ferrari. I, I've, I don't have that close relationship with that brand. They don't really resonate so much for me. I love them, but I'm not. I don't. I always hankered over Porsches, but I. I remember thinking, God Almighty, how did this happen? How you know, five six years ago, I was at university, well, yeah. polytechnic, failing everything, <laughs> and um, so it resonated. But I, but I, but the period between the first contact with the industry, because when you first go into one, as these old days, you, you went into the office, it was a bus, there was the bustle of the place, and all these people that were like your heroes. But when I was, you know, if you asked the twenty one year old me, who did I most want to meet in this world? It wasn't, you know. Michael Jackson or some sports star or someone in, in the media in the normal media I wanted to meet Andrew Frankel him Dickie Mead and I wanted to meet Steve Sutcliffe I wanted to meet Colin Goodwin I wanted to meet Steve Cropley they were my flipping heroes and to suddenly walk into a room and half them to be there I was a I was a nightmare I wouldn't stop talking to them I can remember just as I can remember walking in and their eyes would roll and go oh god not him again <laughs> it's much the same today I'm it sure. is yeah it hasn't changed <laughs> for different reasons but uh, but so 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 let's fast forward and I'll, I'll pick one out of a hat you, you raced a gt40 at spa with gerhardt berger i, I did mean, uh, I, mean, I don't like to talk about it much chris as you know <laughs> no, but no, I mean, I, I, i'm just gonna, i've heard this so i'm gonna leave you a cup of tea now so i'd leave you with edward no but so First of all, how do you, what what mindset do you enter into? Because you're a deeply competitive man. You're a very, very fast racing driver. So how on earth do you subdue the I must prove that I'm quicker than Gerhard well, Berger bit? Because well, you must I, have I didn't, that. obviously, did I? <laughs> <laughs> what was this, the Spa 6 Hour? Spa, yeah. A Spa 6 Hour and an early GT40. Um, the third driver was Paolo Barilla, who's another, uh, well, won Le Mans in the yeah. 956, but he was also an F1 driver, so a contemporary of Gerhard. So that was good fun actually because they they obviously were talking about those days i don't know it's i i i still get quite starstruck i'm i'm rubbish at interviewing properly famous 
drivers or ma- mainly drivers actually i i just don't know what to say did the, you not take control of the situation well, we, we, said, but, 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 i'm starting but gerhard was gerhard was absolutely mega bloke and that came about because the car was prepared by paul anzanti who's known who is you should get him on here actually he would be brilliant fun to talk to but he he's good mates with gerhard um the guy who owns the gt40 that was kind enough to let me race it he's very good friends with paul as well so they wanted to put together a group of people that would they hope would do well in the car um so it's yeah it's all a bit bizarre really isn't it seeing your name stuck on the side of a car with with gerhard berger i don't know i don't know i just sort of rocked up and got in the car and had a go i suppose there's no plan did you finish uh, we didn't finish, but we did put yeah. it on pole. They were, flipping, oh, right, they were yeah. flipping quick when it was going. Yeah, it was. It, it was. I am- was out the back with the Chuckle Brothers. In oh, the, you were you were in the American, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Andrew and Richard, but as I refer to us <laughs> as the Chuckle Brothers, in, uh, we were out the back at the Falcon, not on the same. That piece was of, one of the years you didn't finish. We were on the we were on the second page of the of the of the timesheet. I think I, I agree with you because I like you. I've I've raced some stuff and been in situations that still don't really compute, and I think what you do is you turn up. And you just discharge your duty. You try and drive responsibly. You try and drive quickly. You try and be respectful of the people you're with and really enjoy the time you have with them because you know it's not going to be repeated in many cases. And then you get back and you you lock yourself into your day job. You know, you do whatever you do on Monday morning. And you halfway through the day, as you're having your third cup of tea, you look out the window and think, did that really happen? Yeah, no, it's... it's it it's. Uh, I don't often take selfies, but I did take a selfie of me and... <laughs> me and Gerhard in in the in the truck. Um, what a legend! It, so so let's go. So in terms of road cars, because that's that's what you're best known for. Even though you, latterly you've become historic racing expert, rightly so. You, your your road car stuff is the longer part of your career. What and I get asked this the whole time, and I think it's one of the most glib questions that can be asked, and I find it very difficult to answer. So I'm going to enjoy asking you oh, it no. for a change. What's the best road car you've driven? <laughs> oh my god! Because I get this the whole time. I got. I've got 14 answers. I just yeah. change them. It, it depends what side of the bed you've got out of, isn't it? What you've... So what are you today? <sighs> well, 964 RS, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a lie. <laughs> I, I don't know if there is such a thing, is there? I, mean, th- I don't think there is. It's a constantly changing, evolving, even within yourself, the cars that you... So today you're allowed one car. <sighs> it's got to have a number plate. Oh, blimey. Um... I might have to come back to that. I'm sort of saying singer, but that's really boring, isn't it? Because everyone says that now. Uh, don't say that. <laughs> Edward's about to sell his song. <laughs> <laughs> um, the yeah, I, I have a different. I have a different answer every day. I get. I was fascinated. You've done exactly the same as me. But I might say an old. Well, I would say my old Range Rover if it had moved in the last eight months but it hasn't so but uh, it depends it's got to depend on the road the country for me it's a cobra for, for me it's state of mind i wake up one day and i'll say all i want is a 205 rally and the next day i want an f40 or then i've suddenly been exposed to a really nice old m5 whatever or... you have you want something else don't you or you want a bit of i i i, I grapple with what, what cars would i own if i didn't do the job I'm doing because yeah. I've been able to live a uh, a very charmed vicarious life really because I, I can have an opinion on most significant cars you know high performance cars and well probably 911s particularly from 993 right the way through I'm not in a position to own any of them but I don't know I don't know what I would own if i didn't have access to these yeah. to these i've things. answered that actually I'm, and i've that that gt3 touring i had last year before it expired that's the car I, that's the one car of all of the things i've driven and owned that suited me down to the ground and i and i will get another one because i just think they are it just work for me and i think the one question that i wish i was asked that i never get asked because i tend to do more non-specialist media now do you want to write say, it down I'll they just you. they just <laughs> say yeah so so i'm going to pretend they're asking me this is what's the most impressive car you've ever road tested What's the car that, when you first got in it, exceeded your expectations of what that type of car should do? And for me, by um, some margin, it was the first Ford Focus. The first Ford Focus that I had was a 1.8 litre um, 
sort of very end of development car that we use for the autocar road test. And I remember driving it and just thinking, this is so much better to drive than any hatchback I've ever driven. I mean, it was but I think there was a bending. I think there was a period then when the when the manufacturers were the the power base was with the engineers, wasn't yeah. it? And and it was a pride thing, so they would they would build the best thing they could build. And the, all, you mean the marketing department had, didn't build the car? Well, it's the same with motorsport. Isn't it? we can bang on about motorsport late, later? But I th- I think those those cars, you know, it, it was such a supremely polished product wasn't it far more capable than it needed to be yeah. in so many areas and now it feels like most cars are built right down to a right down to a price and occasionally you'll get a a, a surprise that well normally the surprise comes because an individual got into the finance department that likes cars and then you can you can plot these things in the history of car makers when someone gets when someone that likes cars is given the keys to the the, the vault you'll 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 suddenly have an anomalous product that drives brilliantly that quite often happens but i think to come back to it for me as an individual as individual cars i ju- it, it's a really bad answer because what you when the bloke from the daily express says so what's the best car you've driven you go the 1998 ford focus 1.8 they go it's kind of hoping you're going to say the fandango fettuccine and, zzb 41 and that is a as someone who's never worked for auto car you don't have that, do you? And, I, and I'm up holder because I can hear <laughs> Jethro Bovington in my ears screaming, going, fucking Ford Focus! <laughs> that is a particular take on on those, on those that side of Yeah, I think for cars. me... It's, it, I and I've never really had regular... Exp- I've always... But you must... You must but, uh, the apart perfor- from Car Week, al- always... But the performance always, cars, been... like, I mean, it, occasionally you get in a performance car that just... That has... But from that era, the Puma... It was amazing, wasn't the pube, it? The, uh, Do you remember the gear I, shift? I can still the feel the gear shift, shift the, the way it shift. wrote everything was... That's for you, Ed Callow. Yeah, yeah but it, it, it was a really... Because normally, coupes, are, they're, they're all show and then they're largely disappointment, aren't they? Like, mm. oh, Have you it? ordered the new Puma? They've just oh, launched. I love that. I love a bit of that. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> is, that an, is that an Audi A2? It's, uh, is that before no. it's time? <laughs> <laughs> or no. after it's time? That's a special well, one. If well, you're, li- I'm if you're listening it, to just... this, Jay Ward, we're staying off the Puma. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I haven't driven it, so I can't possibly comment. I think ever, you're but... saying what's the best car you've driven. I, I think it's an easier question to, to ask what, what's the car that makes you feel the best when you're in it and that, that doesn't need to be a, a, no, a well, that, car I, th- a, I think okay so the total opposite to you saying Ford Focus I the the biggest surprise and it's a very very rarefied end but I I, I was fortunate through Evo I was the, the first uh, journalist to drive the Pagani Zonda yeah and it was this slightly curious looking thing that had come from nowhere no one had ever heard of it oh it's got a mercedes engine in it, that's is it a, and there was a sort of whiff of kit car wasn't yeah that's it? a bit weird what you know yeah. it's going to be terrible but we'll we'll go along and drive it got got talking to the pagani guys at G- the geneva show went out and drove the car and honest to god it's like where has this thing come from it's yeah. it's remarkable finished. it works it's brilliantly built goes it that was before you know everything had to have a thousand horsepower and it was just such a amazing achievement and that i i think that's you know pagani's kind of gone the way of a lot of these brands now hasn't it they're 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 for a particular sort of buyer now whereas when they they were coming into a market putting that car down saying lamborghini ferrari whoever we're we're coming at you, and this is every bit as good and probably in my better. toilet at the moment is the copy of Evo that you were part of writing, which was the group test where you had a five fifty Maranello, six litre Diablo, and a Zonda, and a few other bits of bobs. There was a Viper in there as well. It was a massive test. Yeah, oh uh, the Viper. That's uh, a good story about I'll that. Tell us but um, and the Zonda, you forget that what Horatio did. It's, it's, for me, it's rather sad what what it's become now. I just think that, you know, I'm not interested in all the sort of... It, they've become like wristwatches, haven't they? Just ever more complicated yeah. and silly. Um, tell us about the Viper. Uh, right, so that, that group test was... that. That's a very good example of what why Evo is such an exciting place to, to work because I, I can remember, unusually, um, John Barker and I co-edited the magazine for quite a long time. Yeah because it had a sh- small team of people. We were all frontline writers, so we had the vague notion that one of us might be in the office at, at some point to uh, relieve Peter Tomlin of, of all the grown-up 
stresses and strains of magazine production. So John was there busy on some deadline stuff. I was trying to work on some stuff for future issues. And I turned around to him and said, I reckon we should try and do a big, just get all the current supercars together and drive them in Italy. I'll I'll make some calls. And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. So I just made some phone calls. And it remarkably, it all happened. We got, uh, was it a 360? We were doing a 360 then, wouldn't it? Yeah. So 360 and a 550 or 575 from Ferrari. 550 it was. For a group test, which at that point Ferrari Unheard never wanted of. anything compared. Normally they'd give you 400 miles, wouldn't they? There was yeah. all these limits in place. So we got the Lamborghini, which we collected from the factory. We collected the Ferraris from the factory. We drove the 996 Turbo from the UK. We drove the Viper GTS from the UK. It was just the best thing. But the, the Viper was the last piece of the puzzle. And Andy Morgan and I, on a Friday, I think we collected the car from Milton Keynes or somewhere, I can't remember now, at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. And we had to be there to start the photo shoot on Saturday morning. So I just drove the whole way without stopping. And I kept saying, right, Andy, you can drive, you can drive. And then we got to Switzerland and it was pitch black, pissing it down with rain, lorry ruts everywhere. I can't just dump Andy in and fall asleep. So I ended up driving the whole way there in that car. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing you create trip. A, the, the weird thing about these tests is you create a bond with the most unusual, unlikely vehicles, don't you? you I love you, that car. In fact, yeah. I probably have one, actually, because yeah. it was just a really... And they look sensational still. Yeah, they're always a bit shonky, but there's something about them that was special. Only ever had, one of the only vehicles I've sort of half spun on the public road with without even thinking, but I didn't know what was going on. I was early in the morning going to meet David Vivian to do some water car tests in a red Viper GTS, going through the Clapham one-way system, south of Clapham to Wandsworth at four in the morning. It was wet. <laughs> and I was just changing the radio station thinking, God, it's, well, it's still world service. I mean, not, I've not even got farmers today or whatever it is. <laughs> Too early. And um, and I looked down and I thought, I what what happened there? And I was just, it just half spun. In the, yeah, they were pretty snappy things, thing. weren't they? So, I think the road car side. I'm, I'm always I'm always fascinated by the stuff that that we've driven that that we sort of that passes us by, um, but I think Zonda's a really good one because the the first Zonda was like that, that first one that came over here that became Harry's car. Yeah, the C12, and then Harry had a C12 S forward slash F. Um, yeah, S F. Um, but yeah, they hit a real sweet spot, and the car just got better and better and better and better with every with every iteration. Which which I think I don't. I I had a sense then that it was something special, and it was particular to to. It was the only thing that it could only really happen in Italy, even though it's a weird mix of Italian vibe and German engineering and and Argentinian sort of inspiration. But the whole thing together. I don't think anyone is really replicating that. They saw the the Di Tommaso Pantera thing at Goodwood, yeah. which has a little bit of Pagani and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but it's not. Doesn't seem I don't like a think real. Mr. Glickenhaus is very happy about that. No, I can. Well, no, I... He does seem to uh, compare pretty I think much also, every I... new launch to to one of his. I know, but but I think creations. I have a little. I don't always have sympathy, but I have a bit of sympathy there because I think the P that his P four five. There's a, you know, he'll tell you the story. There's a story behind that. You know, he he rebodied his Enzo because yeah. he wanted to. He went to Pininfarina and said, "Do this." In fairness, he's got the he's got the original car, yeah. so he said, "I want an homage and I want you to do it." And once I've done it, I'm going to ask Luca, then Boss, to De Montezemolo, whether whether I can put a Ferrari badge on it. So he he had the thing at the Centro Stile there. Luca flew in in his helicopter. I don't remember the exact story, but Luca flew in his helicopter, was ushered up to say, like, what, what am I doing here? I'm busy. Was They went upstairs, have a look at this, whip the covers off. And he just, and Jim said, I just waited there to see whether he said, burn it or, or we'll sue you or great idea, you can stick a badge on it. And he said the latter and then it literally turned on his heel and went. Yeah. So there's a sto- there's a narrative behind his car at least. I think, th- I think there's a whiff of plagiarism. I think it looks great. And do Which I, one are we talking the about? The Master, I think, looks great. I think the P45 looks great as well. Um, and I, it but doesn't I, really feel like it's a car with a purpose, though, to me. The the Dietmarso, it's sort of a beginning and an end in itself, and it it, it, it exploits this. this what's the weird... engine? Is it an F12 engine or is it a? 
No, it's part of it's that Apollo. Oh, it's we're we're, we're well informed yeah, here, aren't we? But the Apollo, well engine, but the Apollo yeah. engine is the F12 engine. It's a Ferrari. So, I mean, what I will say is, it's I like the fact it's got soft curves and it's a it's a there's a delicacy about it's it. It's not a downforce monster, I, is I'm it? Which done is, with, which I'm is done nice. with these bloody angular things with too many wings and winglets on them. Um, so I'm going to change the track now. And and sometimes this is a place where we air stories that we haven't aired before as a, a kind of public catharsis. Now, I've, there's many things I'll never talk about publicly, obviously, because I'm uh, I'm a responsible adult and things one does in one's youth, you can leave them there. But Richard and I have shared a few scrapes in cars over the years, you can imagine. Um, and uh, there's one particular one that we've, we've never actually talked about it publicly, but we'll talk about it a bit now. And uh, and, and there, there is there is somewhere some footage of it that will never air. But it's about, about 10 years ago, probably, or nine, yeah, nine, 10 years ago. Yeah, it's getting on that We way. were up on... Um, we were in, on, a, on a road in the UK and we were doing one of these magazine group tests on a big, open, well-sighted bit of road. And it was good condition, good good visibility, good weather. And we're going reasonably quickly across this road for uh, a cameraman because there's a little crest on this road and you can and the car gets a bit light. It's not a jump, but you just get that. In, in, in the magazine world with a really good photographer, they'll spot places where the car will do something that doesn't feel very dramatic from inside the car. But to them, it sh- it demonstrates a bit of personality of the car, or just makes it look. It's it gives a sense of motion, a sense of liveliness that that we don't get. That's what separates the great photographers from the average ones. And we were with a good photographer who just said, if you go over that crest, it's just lightning a bit, and you might see a bit of tread block, and it, it'll just look like it's about to leap. A sense of something about to happen. So we he's, he's in a <laughs> wise words. In a, so he's in a Mercedes SLS, and I'm in a GT2 RS, and um, I'm following I'm following at safe distance. And we come over this. We've done. We've gone up and down several times, and we're not going crazy speeds at all. We're just going quite quick. And we come over this crest for the for the umpteenth time. And I come over the crest, and I, my separation from him is so far is long enough so that when he goes over the crest, the photographer can take a frame and then wait for me to come through. But also to give me some safety, braking distance, etc. And I come over this crest, and ev- for the four previous times, I've just seen an SLS squat a bit as it's landed. We're not as into this compressed and then just gone off down this road. But I come over the crest and I see an SLS braking really hard. You can tell it's braking because the rear's jacked up. And I see, and these have come out of nowhere, 10 sheep <laughs> across the road. And I think, well, your brain immediately thinks, options, Chris, what are your options? Well, I, meanwhile, I'm looking in the rearview mirror. Seeing a GT2 with its windscreen <laughs> filled with Chris's eyeballs, showing a little bit of tread. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, what are my options here? I've got, I've, I'm, it's either right or left. So if I go right, I'm going through four sheep and I'm going off onto a moor. I don't want to be. And there. I was kind of going a and little he, bit and, right and he anyway. Was, he, was, he was making the same decisions, but his was based on what sheep do I hit? Um, anyhow, and just to move on to that, no sheep were even touched in this incident. Cloth, because, maybe, maybe. What, sheep. What the not. sheep did, yeah, cloth was touched. These <laughs> sheep, what these sheep came out of nowhere. I didn't see them. They'd been down in this gully, because um, obviously, if you're doing that and there's sheep in the vicinity, you wouldn't, you'd just stop. And uh, these four, five sheep that were on the road, the other five were still about to cross, walked across, and obviously looked right and thought, lead sheep, because there's always a clever bugger, isn't there, that leads. So clever sheep at the front looked right and gone. Oh, there's that. That's that new Merc with the gold wing doors. <laughs> I don't want to get hit by that. And he's gone and he's ca- and he's thought, I'll carry on. So we've carried on. And at the last minute, just as Dickie has committed to go to go left, the sheep decides to go, I'm going back again. I'm going to go left, but I'm going to go back the way I came. By which point I've already, my brain's gone, I'm going left. I've committed to go left because I I'm, I'm just have to avoid this. So as I go, as I go left, Richard has to suddenly go left to avoid the sheep as it turns and just, I'm going into a flying wedge and ever degrees in gap. And, um, at that point, I decided that the road wasn't for me, <laughs> that I'd I'd leave for the moor. And I, I was Max Verstappen to your Charles Leclerc, I yeah, think, in and I Austria. Ended up, so I've, I will now confess, I ended up on the moor, sort of bracken, just or, just bracken hitting the windscreen. It got about, you know, at, re, at a reasonable lick. And um, I, I, well, it wasn't silly speeds, but it was, I, I, you don't want to be doing more than five miles an hour on this bracken. I was going more than five miles an hour. <laughs> And it was just horrifying. Cause I remember thinking, well, I'm a, I'm, you know, this is this is luck now. If, if this digs in, I'm a news story. I'm so, <laughs> and I won't be around to answer the questions afterwards. And I just, and I, and, and somehow, the left front tyre, I remember, I put a little bit of angle into the wheel and thought, if this just responds, we're okay, because I can stay down the, the side of the road. 
and I did, and it did, thank God, and it came back on. But it was a hell of a roller coaster ride, and um, the GT2 didn't look too pretty afterwards. And and there's a, and there is there is a, there's a GoPro somewhere of this, <laughs> and um, locked in a vault. It will never be seen. But the um, yeah, the we sat down in a car after we went down the end of the road, and we just we just sat down. And I, I've played it back, and before we sit down and talk about it, and we're, I'm quite sort of flustered because I'm thinking that wasn't good, and you know these these sheep didn't help us today. Um, you you just hear this at the same time we go, what the fuck was that? Because <laughs> we were just, it, yeah. No, we'll, yeah, lucky. I think is the word. Did the photographer get the shots? Mm, yeah, I think there were some, possibly not. I think we'd already gone past at this point <laughs> with bits of heather and bracken and wool flying and everywhere. Car, and that GT2 RS is still in the UK. Yeah. I know, because I saw it the other day, and I, I've seen it a few times, and every time I see it, I look underneath the left-hand side, <laughs> and you can still see, the, under the floor pan, you can see where it went across the moor. <laughs> um, so, we, yeah, we there, we've had some... We've had some mega times, and I, and some of the other stuff I've done with him. I mean, he's Rich's car control. We were we were, we were once shooting a Drivers Republic film at Kerbera because we were we our bu- <laughs> we go from all the Italian exotic stories. The Drivers Republic budget for our Christmas special. We had no money. We were done. So we we went we hired Kerbera Sprint Circuit for two hundred quid and took whatever we could get hold of. We had a you know everything from a bloody BMW. They were our sort of long term test cars. Weren't yeah, we had they, a we had a Twingo. Play. A Fiesta, a Focus ST, and a Jethro had a four door M three, four door M three, and something else. We thought we'd do a take the Mickey rather than go to Italy. We'll go to the Midlands, anyhow. Kerber Sprint Track. You start right at the very corner of the Sprint Track. It's probably about a mile long. I would have thought of that, just under a mile. And you you go very fast up to a up to a like a thirty degree left, which then tightens on itself. So you basically have to, your speed has to be adjusted for the second left, and it was not, cold and not the first cold left. and a bit wet as well. Cold, I seem to remember. wet, and horrible. And I'm sitting in the passenger seat with him driving. I'm thinking, oh, he's committed. As we go in, he's like second, third, f- fourth. I've never been into fourth here. It, and as he turned in, I thought we're forty miles an hour too fast. It was massively optimistic, wasn't it? Colossal. And, <laughs> and then and then he's and then he's he's had to he's had to back off. And as he's backed off, the back axle just went, I've had enough of this. It was a proper touring BTCC kind of Oh, it was it was like that one that Plato pinned. threw Paddock Hill. We were going backwards at one point, but still going forwards. And he's all he can do is throw lock at it <laughs> and then just bury the throttle. So you got this remember those five cylinder engines in those SE sounded great. It went yeah. for this <laughs> and this you kind of drilled the throttle. And I just closed my I closed my fucking eyes and waited for the impact because it was so obvious it was coming to me. And I opened my eyes and we were heading towards the chicane at yeah, the end. That was all fine. I don't know what you're worrying about. So in terms of yeah, that was a great one. The other one I remember early on in my motoring journalism career was going on the M3 CSL concept launch. <laughs> and just everyone, it was just, well, I've told the story actually because I've told the story about the porn bill afterwards. But, but it the was... The media service. Yeah, the media, media service, standing in that room, standing in that line where you had to pay your bill. The line of shame. And all the <laughs> British journalists stood in the line and are yes. very well known. Shaving Ryan's privates. Didn't know that was a film. <laughs> Anyhow, we... um. We were got there, and the weather got worse and worse and worse. And as the British contingent demonstrated how bad they were at driving, it was just embarrassing. We just thought, well, "That's wet. We'll go out." And we just did. We just stayed out, didn't we? It was like it was like you know when you have you used to do school swimming, and there was free swim at the end. You could just they took the lanes away, and you could just basically bomb people. We, we were. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it. That's what it was. It, we just went round and round. I wasn't very. You know, he was a much better driver than me then, and I, and I still am. And uh, and we'll settle that one day. <laughs> and we um and we and we, I well, I couldn't do what he could do, but I could drift some of the corners. And I was just following him, thinking, bloody hell, that looks good. But I I, you'd pay if you'd stop me then and say, how much you pay to do this? I'd have given you every penny I had in the world. I was just skinning about with the bloke that I'd been reading since I was young in someone else's concept m3 not paying for the tires the track or anything and someone was going to pay me to write the story afterwards yeah i th- I think peak peak living the living the vicarious life for us was 
Le Mans Classic, the, the two of us in D types. How ridiculous is that? <laughs> we over, I overtook him. Down yeah, the I realised they're not all D a, types are born equal. When go. Chris He's got to get it in there now. But I went past him and waved at him and thought, this is absolutely, and again, I apologise for that, it's fucking ridiculous. Two chances yeah. who between them have no formal qualification to do anything <laughs> and have just basically blagged it, ending up in D types, hooning round. It Monami was, mate. It, yeah. it was absolutely, yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. No. The, other, the other one that just sprung to mind, what was I going to say? Oh, it's gone now. What was the, I watched, saw a video the other day of uh, Sutcliffe in a Jaguar oh, S-Type God. when they missed. Well, I, they, I, I, they, they, they were oh, carrying I'll, a bit I'll too get, much speed. I'll get, into st- the, I'll get Steve onto Barcelona. this. Barcelona. Yeah. I won't that give that Barcelona away now, but I won't, I'll get Steve onto this. But yeah, there's a photographer who still limps on the back of that, isn't there? Dear old Shep. Yeah. Um... What was the other one I was I was reminded of that 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 was that we were both involved in that had me crying with laughter? Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. Was it a DR one or was it a post DR one? Where I was just thinking how ridiculous. How on earth did we end up in this situation? Who, who actually down. won the D type race? Uh Christopher. Okay. In fact, I think annoyingly won the plateau itself. It probably, it probably wasn't I a think. real car. Oh, I'd be careful there. Just speak, to, <laughs> speak to Mr. Pearson about that. No, it was uh, his, his Gary's car was good, and um, it was bloody fast. I mean, that that was in the middle of the night. And that was some of the least, well, the most stressful driving I've been involved with, certainly because it was there was oil and everything. You couldn't see anything, and the the car was so fast in a straight line. It was doing one seven five in a straight line, and the braking system on a D type. Talk to me about that. Oh well, the I, rear brakes again in 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 line with the ridiculousness of sharing a car with. Gail Berger, I was showing a detail with Andy Wallace, <laughs> which um, which was quite something. Andy's a Andy's. A we'll get him br- on as well. Br- brilliant guy, but the only thing he he started the race. I think he was second behind Gary. Came into the pits. All he said was, "Watch the brakes into the first chicane." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Drive out the pit lane." And every time. Well, that sounds utterly pretentious in itself. Every time you drive at Le Mans, but every time you go out of the pit lane, it's an extraordinary place to drive, isn't it? Because A, you're driving down the Le Mans pit lane. And you think, why am I here? Am I really here? But then it's the sp- it's the instant speed. speed. So you, you shimmy you through the build. under the under the bridge and then down the hill and then you're out Tetrouge, onto the, onto the straight. On. And it's, oh my God. So first proper proper run in the in the car really i think i'd done a one lap in practice or something and then your flat stick 170 odd in a in a detail trying to judge your braking distance and my theory on braking is it's way harder to slow a car from speed when your braking distance is 350 meters than it is when it's wait for the 100 meter board and hit them as hard as you can honest to god it's the longest slowest motion moment i knew i was possibly going off from the moment i hit the brakes yeah you know because it seems to it would grab and release so the way the wheels individually is that it's got it's got rear disc brakes but they're they come off an actuator so you hit the brake pedal and the front brakes grab but then the gearbox basically spools up and 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 then the rear brakes engage and it's powered by what's coming off so there's a delay so effectively takeoff of the gearbox isn't it and so you so you basically you brake. so you're trying to modulate the, front, the brakes the and the brake, car's the modulating grab, them as well and you think i'm stable then the rear brakes suddenly get involved and the back of the car becomes unstable so then you have to try and modulate the brakes so you start to release the brake pressure a bit because the rears are locking and then the fronts go, well, that's not enough. And the rear, they've got some rear bias. So then you think, I better get back on them again. And you begin the process again. So when you watch people braking, like when you watch Gary Pearson properly driving a D-type, be in no doubt, it's hugely skillful to get it right. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a tricky car. But I, on it, it was the most terrifying five seconds of my life, I think, because it just about made it. Yeah. But there was a fifth well, was, sort of fifth scream. Each I was wheel was a three hundred meter board. The, yeah. There wasn't one. There was a two fifty. There wasn't a three hundred. I was breaking. I was thinking, you know, Chinese restaurant. You know, you're there, yeah. aren't you? It was. It was. And I'd done the any time I'd been there before was to do a Carrera Cup race. Where I was breaking at about one sixty. Yeah. No, I, I think Dicky. One of the things that, that that we missed out on. I, I think the the most fun drive I've ever had with you was that was that twenty four hour Nurburgring, where. 
you couldn't have written it. So we were in rival cars. I was in a Porsche, he was in an Aston Martin, and they were very well matched in performance. We qualified like five places apart in a grid of 140 cars. And we've always, we've never raced against each other. We've always been, you know, known as two blokes that could drive a bit that were journalists. That was it. That was our status. Nothing more, nothing more than that. And we were both selected to do the second stint in these cars. And they came in at the same time from their first stints. And they came, we came out line of stern. I mean, you couldn't have written it. He came out ahead of me. I'm behind him coming down the pit lane on the radio. And I've got my team manager on the radio going, I know who's in the car in front of you. You get it straight away. I know who's in that car in front of you. Remember, it's a 24 hour race. Be respectful of the car and the fact that other people are driving in this race. I'm like, yeah, 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 of course I will. <laughs> right, I've got, I've got to fucking have him now. <laughs> and, and he, he did. And he was, he was doing the same thing. And I could tell he was doing the same thing. He was doing a bit of a belt check or having a, he was on the radio or he was having a chat with someone. Because on the Grand Prix circuit, which is normally you, you come out on the Grand Prix circuit in those days. Now it's a sprint race. But back in those days, you'd, gather, you'd use the Grand Prix circuit to gather your thoughts wouldn't you take a breath and then you and, and then you'd hang it all out on the old circuit so we're on the on the on the on the new circuit and i suddenly think i could go a bit quicker than him on he's doing something i thought well, i'll be a bit rude he was in some traffic and i just stuffed it up the inside on like turn four i was so pissed off <laughs> i <laughs> can imagine i was he, so pissed he must have off. thought no and then i just thought if i get ahead of him now i don't think he's i think the cars are so well matched he will have to do something dramatic to get past <laughs> me and, I, and I'm not sure it's going to happen. And I and we were line astern for six or seven laps yeah. of the North Shore. Yeah, it was a, a stint. And we were it, absolutely. Much. I didn't leave anything on the table in my car. I no, couldn't. that that was that was back in the days when I loved that place. I, and I, sort I of... it was the most enjoyable. I'll tell you now. I, I've I've asked, I've never answered it. It's the most enjoyable drive of my life. I loved it. I loved the fact that I was going toe to toe with a bloke I respected, that I knew was quick, and that we were basically these cars have been driven at a hundred percent, and we weren't taking any prisoners. There was a point where we were going past traffic, and I was thinking, right, is he really going to follow me at this point? Yeah. I'd look in the mirror, and he would be two inches. It felt wrong. I felt. <laughs> I, I felt like, yeah, I wasn't going to explain myself out of any. <laughs> Yeah, it was, any situation and should it was, occur. But it was, it was fun, and the fact we were both there, I just couldn't believe I was doing it. I was just, it was a magnificent, adrenalised, wonderful feeling. And he, and ultimately, the story is on as even, and I'll, I'll give, I'll give both sides of it. I did, I did overtake him at the beginning, but I didn't really gap him. I managed to get a bit of a gap at one point, but ultimately, I suspect I was going absolutely nuts at one point, and the traffic helped me. Um, and but he ran an extra lap than me on his fuel which he all whenever we're having a beer we get to <laughs> two in the morning and, and he'll go he would always go yeah but i went a lot longer on my fuel. So, so he did i think it's on as even but it was that was i don't think i'll ever have more fun i think i'll ever feel more alive or adrenalized or excited in a car than i, I just love that mate i just thought yeah it no was it, was, it was that that was a that was a a, a great period of of our sort of racing lives i suppose that sounds a bit uh, i i I always sort of feel a bit of a fraud racing because we're not because we've been propelled beyond our uh, where we would ordinarily be the bbc will sometimes promote me as a racing driver and i go no i'm not a racing driver i'm not a racing driver and you might have noticed you wouldn't have watched it but in the first ethiopia film i got it into the edit i deliberately said something down the barrel because i got paddy going yeah. Come on then, Chris, you're a racing driver. And I look at the camera and I go, I'm not a racing driver. I occasionally race cars. That's that's how I feel about myself. I'm yeah. not a racing driver. You weren't making an excuse. Of course I was. <laughs> so therefore, he's a racing driver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, look, I think we've covered an awful lot there. Um, it's been great having you along. We'll, we'll have you along again because I think we're going to do the Driver's Republic. Yeah. Years. Oh, actually, but I promised you a gift, didn't I? And you seem a bit thirsty. That's a lovely lampshade. Oh, my God. So, so Richard has just handed me a can of a beverage that's called Rich Energy. So <laughs> for anyone that has been following Twitter, you'll know that we've we've had some interesting conversations with the proprietor of um, of this particular company. Let's get a photograph of this before before this becomes the property of white bicycles. <laughs> Have a taste amazing have a taste um, I, mate I love talking to you we've got so much more we can talk about and we'll do another one but I think there's a, a steady hour and, hour and three quarters there for people um, and 
onwards and upwards. Go, go and go and read Evo. Go and read everything that he's written. This bloke because he's um he's a master of what he does, and uh, and he'll be out in a race car again soon, I'm sure. So that was the Collecting Cars podcast. Uh, with Richard Meaden, with Edward Lovett. That's at Dickie Meaden, at Edward Lovett, and me, at Harris Monkey, because there was a cricket player and a baseball player and some other bloke, I think, from Nuneaton, who already had Chris Harris. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, See you. That's fine.